Welcome to the Lawyerist Podcast with Sam Glover and Aaron Street. Each week, Lawyerist brings you advice and interviews to help you build a more successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are Sam and Aaron. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 119 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Nika Kabiri about how stressed out your clients are and how you can help them make good decisions anyway. Today's podcast is sponsored by FreshBooks, which is ridiculously easy to use and packed with powerful features. Try it now at freshbooks.com slash lawyerist and enter lawyerist in the how did you hear about us section. Today's podcast is sponsored by Ruby Receptionists and it's smart, charming receptionists who are perfect for small firms. Visit callruby.com slash lawyerist to get a risk-free trial with Ruby. And today's podcast is sponsored by Spotlight Branding, which wants you to know that having a new website designed for your law firm doesn't have to suck. Spotlight Branding prides itself on great communication, meeting deadlines, and getting results. Text the word website to 66866 in order to receive a free website appraisal worksheet. So Aaron, later in my conversation with Nika, I bring up sort of an anecdote from Jordan Furlong's new book called Law as a Buyer's Market. And uh, in it, he makes an argument. And when I mentioned it, you decided you didn't like the premise. So I'm going to just sum up the point that he makes, um, because I think it's interesting. And I want to jump off and talk about it. So Jordan says that law firms use words to market themselves like excellence and high quality and zealous advocacy and other luxury terms. And he says that whether they realized it or not, lawyers presented themselves as an extravagant purchase to a market for which extravagance was not just out of reach, it was also a little insulting. And that's a quote from his book. I've taken it out of context, obviously, but not too far out of context. And tell me what you don't like about that. So I largely reject the premise of the blanket statement that this is how lawyers talk about themselves. I'm well aware that those are terms that some lawyers sometimes use to talk about themselves. But I know plenty of lawyers who market themselves as being compassionate or solving your problem. And I reject the premise that the idea that zealous advocacy should be associated with a luxury good. That is precisely the thing that all lawyers should do. In your conversation with Nika in a moment when you were talking about this, it's weird to talk about in the future you talked about. <laughs> in the future, yeah. back to the future yeah, is yeah. podcasting uh-huh. defined. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that your analogy here is that kind of the luxury languages of luxury automobiles and why aren't there lawyers that are Toyotas? I just dispute the idea that zealous advocacy somehow would be associated with a luxury car, but that zealous advocacy doesn't associate with a Toyota Corolla. Like you as a lawyer are meant to represent your client Some lawyers will represent their clients as the best lawyer to get the best result. Some will represent their clients effectively by solving their problem quickly and efficiently. Some will do it by holding your hand and understanding you. And lawyers talk about themselves in a hundred different ways, and they don't all hold themselves out as the luxury lawyer. Some do. But you know what? Some clients want that. Jordan is painting with a broad brush, and that's his prerogative. It's his book. I think that lawyers have traditionally, whether they have held themselves out as a luxury good or not, they certainly have priced themselves that way. It, it is kind of interesting. You know, there aren't a whole lot of lawyers saying, eh, well, you know, we're good enough. We'll give you good enough uh, legal documents or we'll give you good enough service to get it done. I, I, again, I, I dispute the premise. Um, it depends on the lawyer and the practice area. I watch TV commercials, or used to in the 80s because I don't watch commercials anymore, (laughs) for criminal lawyers and PI lawyers and bankruptcy lawyers who are all about the speed and efficiency and price with which they will get your thing solved. It isn't at all about the leather desk and the fancy office. It's all about solving your problem quickly because I'm here for you. Yeah, that could be. I I don't know. I'm I'm uncertain how I feel about this right now. But I I guess I'm curious about how people think about that. Uh, Maybe maybe our listeners want to shoot us an email and weigh in. I'd be curious if you know of examples of lawyers who are marketing themselves more like Honda Civics than Mercedes. I'd be interested to see some examples of that because I'm I'm not sure I think... Think I can think off the top of my head of too many examples so, of that. So, I mean, I think part of the issue is you are absolutely right that most lawyers price themselves in mm-hmm. a way that makes their services a luxury good. Yeah. That is not what we are talking about. 
that's not what jo the case Jordan is making. I absolutely agree that if everyone is $250 an hour, then that is not something that's accessible to people. And I know there are lots of efforts to do unbundled services, flat pricing to make the pricing of lawyers more accessible. But as far as the messaging of lawyers, I think the issue here is not that there is one message that is wrong for all consumers or all users of legal services. The issue is that you should have a match with what your message is with the work and clients you are trying to find. And so if what you're trying to do is serve consumers in a way that is efficient and affordable for them, then your messaging should match that. If you're at an AMLA 100 firm trying to reach Fortune 500 CEOs, you absolutely should talk about excellence because you're solving a different Although, problem. Actually, in this day and age, you should probably talk more about efficiency. But And I want to rehabilitate Jordan a little bit here because the point you just made is also his. Right. I, that is the broad <laughs> point he's trying to make is yeah. law is a buyer's market, meaning talk to and serve your clients. Don't use language that sounds good to you. Your marketing language should reflect your audience, not well, you. Well, actually, his larger point is more about the need for alternative client service models. That it, there's essentially... I mean, now there, now there are maybe two or three different client service models, but that lawyers need to stop selling one product in one way and marketing it in one way. And lawyers need to reach out and try and find alternative ways to create client service models, market them, deliver them, all that kind of stuff. And he, he's talking more to mid to large firms, but um, a lot of small firms are headed that way. And we're seeing more of it. Our TBD law people are... Our community there is is working on different client service models, and, it, and obviously there are things like chatbots and LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer, and there's Axiom, and there's there's all kinds of different approaches to it that are starting to find new client service models. And so I'm I'm optimistic, and I think Jordan is too, that lawyers are going to start figuring this out, and um, it, it'll be interesting to see what shakes out the bottom. But if you if you have examples of lawyers that um, market themselves in different ways. I would just be interested in collecting some of those. So shoot us an email and and give us some examples of different approaches to legal marketing. I'd like to see them. And with that, here's my conversation with Nika on a slightly different topic of how to help your clients deal with their stress. Hi, I'm Nika Kabiri. I'm the Director of Strategic Insights at Avo. I spend um, all of my time researching legal consumers so that lawyers can help them better. Awesome. Thanks for being with us, Nika. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I just saw on your white paper that you have a doctorate. Um, what are you a doctor of? I do. I have a PhD in sociology. I kind of got there in a roundabout way. I like to call myself a failed lawyer. I had a JD in a previous life, and I did not really like law. So I just sort of went back to school to study law in a kind of a social way. Very cool. So you are uniquely qualified to study the intersection of uh, attorney-client relationships in law and sociology. Very cool. Yep. So um, today we were going to talk about uh, client stress, and this is related to a white paper that you just put together. And... Um, We'll be putting it on the show notes. So if you want to get it, just go ahead and uh, look at the show notes for this episode and you should be able to download that PDF. Um, and it's about client stress. And so maybe you should start out and just give us a little background about, you know, where did the white paper come from and um, kind of talk about um, how did you put together the data? Right. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned, I, I spend pretty much all of my time here at AVO talking to people who have legal issues and trying to understand their pain points as they resolve these issues. And one thing that just kept coming up over and over again was this, this notion that they're, they're stressed, they're under stress, um, particularly when they are about to um, hire a lawyer or seek out a lawyer to hire. And, you know, it's kind of an obvious thing because any, any lawyer who's practiced long enough will see stress in their clients that, that come in. But, um, you know, just knowing what I've known about the impact of stress on human behavior from studying sociology and psychology and all of that, it just, it kind of made us want to explore this a little more. What is this stress doing? What is it making people do? Yeah. And I guess something that maybe I hadn't really fully appreciated before I started reading your study was like the process of, uh, well, the process of solving legal problems from the client perspective is just stress, top to bottom, side to side, front to back. Like, it's just yeah. <laughs> whether or not you're going to do it with a lawyer, 
Um, it is stressful. You, finding a lawyer, hiring a lawyer, paying a lawyer, all of that process, making decisions through the course of representation, it's just top to bottom. It's full of stress. It is. And on top of that, even if you don't have a legal issue, so the American Psychological Association does research on stress um, on a regular basis, and they found that eight out of 10 people, whether they have a legal issue or not, eight out of 10 people experience moderate stress every day. So add that um, to a legal issue. And then the fact that they... Your base level is stressed, in other words. Issue, it's, it's, yes. <laughs> Baseline normal is stress. And we sort of take it for granted. Like, okay, people are stressed. And then we sort of move on from that. But we don't really, um, I don't think I have until I started digging into this, really explored what that means. Yeah. Well, so what that does. So how, let's start with how did you dig into that? Like, where does the information in the white paper come from? It comes from a variety of sources. So first of all, we were trying to understand um, what does the stress that consumers experience look like. So I did a survey of about um, a thousand general population. Um, so they're not just users of our site. They're okay. not users of any particular site. They're just people out in the world that have had a legal issue in the past two years. And we just asked a bunch of questions about their level of frustration, um, their how high of a, a stakes involved with their legal issue, just a bunch of questions of, about that sort of thing. Can, can I can I ask just like, how do you find those people? Because I'm, I'm just curious, like nuts and bolts, like yeah. if I wanted to go <laughs> find out information like this, how do I find a thousand people who've had a legal problem in the last two years? You know, it's it's really, there are companies that specialize in ah. collecting people who are willing to take surveys. Mm -hmm. And so basically you would just hire one of these companies um, to go out and they, they do that for you. They go out and they find people who have had legal issues in the past two years. They pull them all together and they kind of siphon them through their, the survey that you give them. And these people take the survey and then they get, get, they get the data to you. So, okay, so that's one source. And I, I saw from the footnotes, you were pulling from a variety of other s existing studies as well, looked like. Oh, there there are so many brilliant people out there who have studied <laughs> the subject of stress in a number of different places, everywhere from, you know, the Harvard School of Business to the American Psychological Association. Um, there's just so much out there. And I think we often don't um, take advantage um, of this information. I don't enough. And so I just... But, you know, we really do need to see what these people are saying. So I've drawn on their research quite a bit. Maybe maybe stress is something we all talk about. And um, maybe we don't stop to understand what it actually is. And uh, my takeaway from this uh, is that the simplest way to understand it is stress is, you've got more technical definitions, but the way our body experiences stress, stress is a little bit like if uh, we were cave people and we looked outside of our cave to see a saber-toothed tiger. And the way our body responds right. in that moment is actually quite similar to the way our body responds to um, any other stressors. Is that right? Right. Right. It's it's very much that way. It's like a flight or um, fight sort of um, experience or reaction. Um, and, you know, I've our heard that heart called the lizard brain. Yeah, lizard brain. It's it's a it's a kind of a <laughs> it's not it doesn't it's not a rational kind of experience. Yeah. Um and it it just sort of hits you. And I think and this isn't in the white paper at all. This is just an aside that I've had a personal trainer who who's who recommended that when you do experience that, if you don't exercise right away and the cortisol in your body just sort of starts to to kind of take its its toll and you can gain weight. So like really? if you do experience stress, do a bunch of push ups right away and it'll help you kind of calm that down because your body is expecting something really action. intense to happen and you action yeah. and it's physically preparing yourself for that. So um, that's sort of, that's sort of what happens. But it's, what's interesting is that's really not, we think about that as stress, but it's really more a stress response. Mm -hmm. It's a response to um, a situation that, you know, that I would think of as, as stress, which is, it's a totally different thing. So uh, you, d you described in the white paper as when, when, you need to do something, um, but your resources available to complete that task exceed the demands of the task. So like you just yeah. aren't, you're not emotionally, um, financially, physically ready to deal with divorce, but you have to, um, or, but or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And if you think about it outside of law, right? So you need to get to work. There are a million cars that are in the way. Traffic is terrible. And you just can't get there. Mm -hmm. So you need to be someplace at a certain time. Something's blocking you. 
the route to your objective is blocked and stress can kind of can kind of the stress response can emerge from that. So even just something as simple as that can be explained by this particular definition. Now I have to say there are a number of different types of definitions of stress, different um, um, experts think about it in different ways, but this definition to me, which comes from um, study of emergency management, seems to have the most relevance to legal issues. Yeah, I need to kill a saber tooth tiger, but all I have is a sharpened stick. Right, right. <laughs> or I'm or, or I'm too small. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> or I'm too weak. I, that or seems totally whatever it is. That seems totally intuitively yeah. it's easy to get my head around that. Right. Um that makes a lot of right. sense to me. So it makes you do silly things. You can do kind of dumb things when you're stressed out because you're not thinking rationally. Well, so let's talk about that because you you really broke this down in detail that for example, the way we process uh and make uh risk decisions, um the way we deal with risk is kind of weird when we are under stress. Yeah. So this is one consequence of the stress response or the reaction to not having the resources you need to get something done. Um, so studies on risk behavior or risk averse behavior have shown that um, when um, that people who are, well, let's just say people who aren't under risk or under stress, they're generally more likely to be risk averse when they're choosing between two positive outcomes. And if they have to choose between two negative outcomes, they're much more likely to be risky. So if you're facing um, a situation where if you go one way, you could, let's say, end up in jail for 25 years. If you go another way, you could end up in jail for 20 years. I don't know. This is just an unexpected. You may just go like, ah, fuck head. it. Let's take the risk. Let's just screw it. Yeah. yeah let's just take a <laughs> risk. Or... Um, or in a divorce, like if I if I negotiate this this way, I could lose the house. If I negotiate this way, I could lose the you know my my the two cars. You know, screw it. Let's just go balls out and argue until we can't argue anymore, right? Because it's not we're just going to take the risk and go. So yeah, conversely, if there are two positive outcomes, you're less likely to take the more positive outcome. You're if there are two positive outcomes, you're more likely to be thoughtful, mm -hmm. less less risk-taking, more conservative. Gotcha. Now, what happens when you're under stress is that this gets exacerbated. So two negative outcomes will lead to more risky behavior than even before. Two positive outcomes will make you more risk-averse than ever before. So you can imagine if you're an attorney and you're providing your client with options, that if they're under stress, and the options are both negative, then they're likely not to think very carefully about those options. They're likely to just say, screw it. Let's just, you know, hmm. roll the dial, just whatever. But if you offer them two positive outcomes or options, they might be a little bit more thoughtful about it. So um, what I've recommended to attorneys is if there are two options that you're providing, make sure that both options have a positive outcome presented. Otherwise, they're just going to ignore um ignore, you know, rationality. Yeah. And to the other, the other way um, to think about it also is that they will respond more to positivity. So you think about stress as like this negative emotion. So people might think about being, you know, all gloom and doom when they're stressed out. But the truth of the matter is, is that they don't want to hear bad, bad stuff. Right. They want to hear the good stuff. So keeping things positive, not not like, hey, you can do it positive, but more presenting options um, that are equally positive could be um, really helpful in helping them think more rationally about things. You said also that, um, and th this is just, this is kind of a duh thing, I guess, but like, it's really hard to concentrate and think logically and rationally when you're experiencing a strong stress response. Obviously, like you got blood pumping in your ears and it's oh, yeah. hard to just, and you're, you're, your heart is racing and, you know, it, I, I guess it depends on which kind of stress, but it's ju really just a matter of degree. If you're thinking about losing your home or losing your kids or losing your freedom, uh, you're probably going to be pretty stressed out and it's really hard to stop and just think carefully and rationally about something. Can't concentrate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is, it, it, to me, it explains why a lot of people who are go going through a divorce 
um, you know, you hear horror stories that lawyers tell about like what, what seem to be really kind of dumb people making kind of dumb decisions, like arguing and arguing mm-hmm. and arguing over like one little over thing. Over the computer that is worth 500 bucks. <laughs> totally. And then racking up $2,000 in billable hours yeah. just to fight over this computer. Um, but the truth of the matter is they're not thinking straight and they're also thinking about what they're going to get and not what they're going to lose. They're thinking about the positive of I get to get this computer. I get to get back at him or whatever and not thinking about rationally what they're going to lose out when they when they get the bill. And potentially it's the lawyer's fault, which is what we're going to talk about in just a couple minutes. So we need to stop and hear from our sponsors. And then I want to talk about the do's and don'ts and why maybe it's partly the lawyer's fault that people make dumb decisions like that. So we'll be back in just a few minutes. So you're racing against the clock to wrap up three client projects, prepping for a meeting later in the afternoon, all while trying to tackle a mountain of paperwork. Welcome to modern life as a small firm lawyer. The working world has changed. With the growth of the internet, there's never been more opportunities for the self-employed. To meet this need, FreshBooks is excited to announce the launch of an all-new version of their cloud accounting software. It's been redesigned from the ground up and custom-built for exactly the way you work. Get ready for the simplest way to be more productive, organized, and most importantly, get paid quickly. The all-new FreshBooks is not only ridiculously easy to use, it's also packed full of powerful features. Create and send professional-looking invoices in less than 30 seconds, set up online payments with just a couple of clicks, and get paid up to four days faster, see when your client has seen your invoice, and put an end to the guessing games. FreshBook is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to our listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com lawyerist and enter lawyerist in the how did you hear about us section. This podcast is supported by Ruby Receptionists. As a matter of fact, Ruby answers our phones at Lawyerist, and my firm was a paying Ruby customer before that. Here's what I love about Ruby. When I'm in the middle of something, I hate to be interrupted, so when the phone rings, it annoys me, and that often carries over into the conversation I have after I pick up the phone, which is why I'm better off not answering my own phone. Instead, Ruby answers the phone, and if the person on the other end asks for me, a friendly, cheerful receptionist from Ruby calls me and asks if I want them to put the call through. It's a buffer that gives me a minute to let go of my annoyance and be a better human being during the call. If you want to be a better human being on the phone, give Ruby a try. Go to callruby.com slash lawyerist to sign up, and Ruby will waive the $95 setup fee. If you aren't happy with Ruby for any reason, you can get your money back during your first three weeks. I'm pretty sure you'll stick around, but since there is no risk, you might as well try. Spotlight Branding is an internet marketing company that doesn't suck. Most solo and small firm lawyers have had at least one truly miserable experience with a web designer or internet marketing company. So if the idea of launching a new website for your law firm makes you queasy, they get it. Spotlight Branding prides itself on excellent communication with its clients, being responsive, professional, respectful, and delivering what it tells you it's going to deliver. Spotlight Branding works exclusively with solo and small law firms. Services include law firm website design, email newsletter management, social media marketing, and more all designed to make your law practice more profitable. And Spotlight Branding is currently offering a free gift to our listeners. Simply text the word WEBSITE to 66866 and receive their free website appraisal worksheet, an easy way to evaluate your web presence, identify what's working, and spot opportunities to improve. Okay, and we're back. And so, Nika, I I set this up by saying, maybe it's the lawyer's fault that people fight over cheap computers. So, and, and, and I think, <laughs> uh, I, and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like, par- it seems to me like now that we know some more about stress, it's the lawyer's job to uh, work with that and help their client make good decisions despite the stress. So what should lawyer, what do lawyers do that's a, a mistake <laughs> besides just completely yeah. ignore it? Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to just sort of kind of respond to the whole thing about it being the lawyer's fault right, because it kind it kind of is. But it really is more like a situation of perception being reality. If a client makes a really irrational decision under stress, they're not going to perceive it to be their fault. They're going to perceive it to be the lawyer's fault. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is the lawyer, and I'm sure many lawyers have this experience, that they have to kind of make up for some of the dumb decisions that their clients make. They have to work around them um, and kind of work with suboptimal situations. So what ends up happening is that the client may not love the lawyer, even though it's not their fault. It's just seen as their fault. And they might not refer the lawyer and the lawyer might miss out on future business. They might miss out on the opportunity to grow their practice. So um, there is this responsibility as an attorney to feel 
a sense of empathy for your client and help them. But there's also this component of, you know, helping yourself, avoiding those situations where you get to be the bad guy when it's really not you that's being the bad guy. It's the stress. So whether or not uh, it is fair to actually say it's the lawyer's fault, it's kind of going to be and you need to work it's around it. It's kind of going to have to be the lawyer's <laughs> responsibility because they're the one, even though lawyers experience a lot of stress themselves, it's 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 up to them and it's in their best interest to, to, to manage their, their client's stress. So the first place to start is to not tell your client to chill out. Don't tell, <laughs> um, don't tell someone. I think most people who've been in an argument with someone who's been like really stressed out can tell you like just telling this person to relax just makes them more angry. And there's actually research behind this. First of all, it takes. I can't about wait to tell this to my wife. By the way, I know. this is an "I told you so" moment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> there. I mean, it will take 20 to 60 minutes for a person to even physiologically calm down. That flight or fight response, and that's even if there's no added stress hmm. after the initial trigger. So, telling somebody to chill out is not gonna. It's not gonna do anything. And also, it's sort of like um, putting. A, I like to kind of use the analogy of putting a lid on a steam of boiling water that, yeah, the steam is not coming out as much, but it's really kind of heating up a lot more and it will eventually overflow. So there's a lot of psych research on this and and that suppressing that stress will come out in really worse ways. So then you'll have the client that yells on you at you over the phone or gets even more angry. They might seem fine and then they'll come back and just be really, really upset later because they had to kind of stuff it. So don't tell them to relax. (laughs) Don't tell me to calm down. (laughs) Don't don't tell me to calm down. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And also like if you're if you're thinking about like your advertising and your marketing messaging and you're marketing to people and advertising to people who are stressed and to kind of use messaging that says, hey, relax, I'm here, um, that might not be as effective because they won't they won't really what that might not resonate with them as well. So what might resonate with them is if we go back and think about the definition of stress to begin with, it's this gap between what they need to get it done and what they have they have to get it done. And to message that you're filling that gap for them, that if what they're lacking is information, what they're lacking is clarity or knowledge about the law, which is what most people are, then you can suggest in your ad marketing materials, hey, I have experience, I have knowledge, I can give you clarity. Essentially, you it, when you hire me, you have a new resource. Yeah. Um, I've just expanded your resources and now we we exceed the resources we need to meet the demand. Totally. It's like being stuck in traffic and having um, you know a police escort come and park traffic for you. Yep. So you don't have to stress out, you can get there. And that is probably the best place to start. So I, what I used to tell my clients, uh, I, I sued debt collectors and, and, and I defended people sued by debt collectors. And so my clients were experiencing financial stress, which is one of the biggest kinds of stress. Yep. And uh, they would come in and, and they would, after they signed a retainer with me, I would say to them, okay, this is my problem now. Um, let me stress out about it. Um, I will take care of it. And you can go home and, and not worry about it anymore because I've got this. And I'm trying to decide if that was the wrong message now or not, because it sounds a little <laughs> bit like, calm down, I've got this. But at the same time, I, I felt like I watched my clients uh, sort of decompress as I told them that. Right. Because I think what I was sort of telling them in, in different words was, um, okay, it's on my shoulders now, and my shoulders are big enough to handle this. I'm the resource that you needed, and I've got it now. Right, right. I mean, there are probably two parts that both of those are probably happening. Yeah, they're they're sensing that you're the resource that that they were not having before, and they can they can relax. But I think if um, with follow ups with keeping them in the loop, then they can they can continue feeling relaxed because I think. Um, you know, not knowing what's going to happen, that uncertainty can also cause a lot of stress. It's sort of saying, chill out, go, you know, go away. I got this taken care of. Um, there's been some research on stress in among military personnel that's really kind of interesting and relevant here. Um, research has found that when military personnel have very low levels of stress, they don't perform very well. And if they have super high levels of stress, they don't perform very well. But there's this sweet spot where you know, there's enough stress to kind of get their blood going, but it's not too much to overwhelm them, and they perform really well it's more like under this. Focus stress. 
Yeah. I mean, I think some of us have been, um, especially lawyers, if you, you know, you're going into the courtroom to litigate a case and you're super prepared, it's stressful, but you're, it's under control and you, you feel like you can conquer that. And I think if you could imitate that feeling or create that feeling, sorry, for your client, um, yeah, I've got this under control. We've got this under control. It's still their case. It's like when you're in the they zone. They can handle it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, totally. I, I mean, there have been, there have been oral arguments where I'm, you know, citing facts from the record and, um, you know, synthesizing arguments from cases that in ways that I had never even occurred to me before and it's coming out <laughs> perfectly. And I'm just like super lawyer. And yeah, if you I can know. focus your clients in that way, that is awesome. Right. I've been there too, where you're just like, uh, you're like, how am I even doing this? But it is, it's that super focused space. I feel like a lot of that is in the way, like, so, so one of the, one of the things that lawyers do, um, and have to do that create stress for their clients is, okay, it's decision time, right? Like here are, um, I, here is the, the problem that we're facing and I need you to make a decision. And so we're asking our clients um, to do that. And, and the ways that we can, you, you said it already, like phrasing each option. Uh, first of all, give your clients yeah. options, right? Don't just present them a problem and say you sort it out, but like treat those options as if they are both positive. Right. Um, I don't know if I can come up with an example on the fly of that though. Do you have one in mind? Um, I, I, I kind of do. So I'm, I'm going back to the example of a plea agreement, Mm -hmm. um, where you can tell, um, your client, okay, you accept this agreement and you will, your case, you'll have closure. Case will be over. You don't have to go to court. You don't have to drag this out. You, um, you know, you don't accept the plea agreement. You could go to jail for 25 to life, Mm -hmm. right? So what you have on the one hand is a positive outcome. And on the other hand, you have a negative outcome. So first of all, don't assume that your client is going to rationally kind of ask questions or think it through. They're freaking out, right? Their life is on the line. They're freaking out. So um, what they're going to do is they're going to focus on that positive outcome. Oh, I get closure. I get to kind of put this behind me. I don't have to go to trial. That's going to sound really loud to them compared to the negative outcome. So the best way to go is to say, offer a positive and a negative consequence to the plea agreement. You can have closure to your case, um, but you will give up the opportunity to um, to clear your name. You will not have a chance to um, uh, have zero jail time, right? Or if you, if you decide not to take the plea, you could go to jail for 25 to life, but you have this opportunity to clear your name, et cetera. And then, of course, just clearing up, like, what are the chances of everything happening? Um, because risk, risk is is a situation where you don't know what the outcomes are. Um, making sure that they know clearly the chances, not the outcomes, but the chances of each outcome. Making sure they know clearly, like there's a pretty good chance or there's a terrible chance, that will help them um, as well. Well, and I, I guess you're you're sort of touching on certainty, and you brought this up in a in another context around pricing. Um, <laughs> lawyers maybe don't appreciate how much uncertainty is built into just give me some money and I'll bill you by the hour. I mean, there, there's, yeah. and, and literally just by doing that, you've, you've ratcheted up the base level of stress around the legal uh, matter that you're working on because everything you do, how much is this going to cost me? How much is it going to cost me? Exactly. Yeah. And you know, I've talked, I've talked to many consumers who've told me, you know, lawyers are expensive. Sure. But good ones are worth it, and they're willing, even though those the ones that are price sensitive and equally the ones that aren't, they're willing to to pay the right. They're willing to pay money, good money, for a good lawyer. But they kind of want to know how really, much. <laughs> they don't want to be a surprise. Yeah. That does kind of freak them out a little bit. So that's why fixed fee services or flat rates, um, it kind of takes away, even if it's a high amount, it's a lot better than an uncertain amount. Or even just an estimate. I mean, I, I imagine I would rather um, have somebody say, look, in the end, this is going to cost $30,000 than to right. not know how much it's going to cost and end up paying $20,000. I think I'd rather pay 30 and be pretty confident that that's how much I'm in for than to end up paying 20 after not knowing for months and months and months or years and years how much it was ultimately going to cost. I'm the same way because you can prepare for that. You can kind of anticipate that. And also another thing that's useful is to, um, it's it doesn't have to be like all or none. I think a lot of um, clients or a lot of consumers 
they they feel like they can handle parts of cases themselves. I think uh, this is kind of a sillier example, but it, it, the message is 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 pretty clear. One woman I talked to said, "You know, I don't need my lawyer to make Xerox copies for me or and then stamps. bill me. You know, <laughs> yeah, and you know, I don't need that. He can give me the originals, and I can go and make those copies at you know a copy shop myself, um, and I can save money that way. And there's a little bit of well, there's, you know, a negative perception of lawyers around that, but also just being very clear up front of like, what are you paying for? What aren't you paying for? And what can you do yourself that, you know, that you don't need to pay a lawyer for? You mentioned that in marketing, lawyers should convey their willingness to work hard. Uh, tell me more about that. Why is that yeah. more effective than saying like, I will give you high quality representation or I'm the hammer and I'm going to go after them or something like, why is, <laughs> why is hard work a better value proposition on marketing materials? So this is really interesting. This actually came out of a study that I did on, um, on millennials, hmm. on younger legal consumers. Um, but I've also found it to resonate among older consumers as well. And it really, it, it's about you know, what constitutes a good lawyer? What does a good lawyer look like? They're all the specs, right? Um, you can read reviews, you can see how many years they practice, you can see what law school they've gone to, but then there's always this X factor and everyone is looking for that. I have not yet met a consumer or a legal um, consumer who isn't willing or really wanting to um, interview their lawyer first to look for that X factor. And that's the X factor, how hard they're willing to work because People are very realistic. They know that they may not win. They know that if they get a divorce, they are probably not going to get everything they want. Um, they know that if they um, file for bankruptcy, it might not turn out exactly the way they'd like it. Hmm. They are realistic about that. What they want to know is, does this lawyer have my back? And is it going to, is he or she going to get me as much as possible? And, and that's where working hard and drive to them is sort of like an indicator of that. It's sort of like a, a message or a signal that okay, they're gonna they're gonna get me as much as they can. I mean that that kind of touches on so many of the uncertainties around the attorney client relationship. Um, you know, is this lawyer just charging me a bunch of money, or are they actually you know doing what they've said they're gonna do? You know, and and when yeah. the number one cause of uh, of compl- bar complaints is lack of communication, because if I'm not yeah. communicating with you, the impression is I'm not doing anything for you. And you want to know yeah. that you're that I am, especially. And if that bill shows up and I was billing you despite not returning your phone calls, I mean, screw that guy. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> that makes so much sense. Exactly. And it, and you know, this is where stress kind of comes back in. People who are under stress, their memory sucks. Mm-hmm. They just cannot remember very well. So you could have been responsive. You could have gotten back to them. They might not have remembered. You might have clarified very, you know, in, in very clear terms what the milestones of their case are, what to expect. They might not remember. And that's where over um, communication yeah. uh, might be a, a better way to go. Just respond a couple times. Remind them over and over of what was, what was yeah. I've, I've just started reading Jordan Furlong's book, uh, Law is a Buyer's Market. And he talks about the way lawyers typically describe their services and how so many lawyers describe their high quality representation and and they use quality markers and things in describing how great they are. And he says, that's like um, saying that everybody wants to buy a Mercedes, but how do you advertise your services (laughs) as a Toyota? You know, I want a Toyota Corolla. I want a toaster that never breaks, that always runs, that works hard, that gets good mileage. And I I suppose advertising your reliability, your hard work, your consistency, um, those are the kinds of hallmarks that say, like, you're going to get your money's worth. Like, I'm going to work hard for you, and you're going to get right. what you paid for. Right. And there's, so there's another part of this as well, which is when you talk about a product, like a car or a lawyer being high quality, first of all, the focus is on them mm-hmm. and on what they are. And it's not so much on what they're going to do for you. And I think consumers more and more want to hear, what are you going to do for me? And second of all, quality is really... Um, it's kind of objective, but it's kind of subjective. So, so sure, um, a Mercedes is a high quality vehicle or, or whatever car you want to choose might be a high quality vehicle. But what if I don't need, what if I need an off road vehicle? Yeah. Then is it a really quality? Is it high quality for me? So it's, it's, I think consumers now because, um, and I've written another white paper about this as well, because they have, 
access to so much information via the internet. They're connected to each other more than ever. They can be picky. They have so many options available to them. There's really this emphasis across all companies, brands, categories. Consumers want to personalize as much as possible. And I think to say I'm a high quality lawyer doesn't really say much about how that's personalized to you. Saying I work really hard for you is a little bit closer to that. Yeah, and to and to say it, I, I'm going to work hard is an assurance of some certainty. Not um, it, it removes some vagueness from the equation. I think so. Right. Um, let's see. If, can we tie this up? Can we say you know what what are the top do's and don'ts for lawyers, or maybe what are the, some of the best tips for lawyers to help calm their clients um, so that they can make good decisions right. or work um, work with their stress so that they can help their clients feel more confident in the decisions that they're making or in the outcomes they're getting? Sure. So first, be um, kind of be vigilant and trying to identify what's missing for them. And um, in other words, what is creating that gap? Is it knowledge that they don't have? Is it money that they don't have? What is keeping them from from having all the resources they need to get the job done? And then work with them and message to them that you can fill that gap. So thinking about the definition of stress that way helps out a lot. Um, the second thing to remember is help them remember. They're going to forget a lot of things because they're under stress. So help them recall what, what they need to recall. Um, point out positive consequences. Um, uh, talk about outcomes, not just in negatives, but in positives so that they can be a little bit less risky and a little bit more rational about their decision making um, and that they aren't um, they aren't acting just on reaction and habit. And, you know, again, alternative billing models are part of a lot of this. But whatever you do, don't tell your clients to chill out. <laughs> they are just not going to react. Don't, don't tell them to do that. Awesome. Nika, thank you so much for being with us today to talk about client stress. And um, again, I will include the white paper in the show notes. So when, as soon as you get a chance, go check it out. Um, thanks very much, Nika. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit lawyerist.com slash podcast or legaltalknetwork.com. You can subscribe via iTunes or anywhere podcasts are found. Both Lawyerist and The Legal Talk Network can be found on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and you can download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play or iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said during this podcast is legal advice.